The unfinished obelisk, or Aswan obelisk, is the largest obelisk in the world. It differs from other obelisks in that it was not separated from the granite of the quarry from which it was hewn. It cracked and was left in that state for thousands of years without any attempts to utilize the rock. Very odd given that granite is a very valuable material. And if it hadn't cracked, the Egyptians would certainly have erected it somewhere. That is what historians and one British engineer Egyptologist, Reginald Eichenbach, believed. This is his diagram of the presumed installation of the Aswan obelisk. And this is how he depicted the presumed transportation of the obelisk on sleds. And everyone, including the scientific community, believed that these transportation and installation methods were possible using relatively primitive tools and equipment. In reality, this is what he did at the beginning of the 20th century, his engineering background coming in handy. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we have to reveal that these works were in fact made of concrete. After the obelisk was ready, Engelbach finished it with sand, stones, and macadam. And then, after a suitable passage of time, dug up by Eichenbach himself and presented to the public the world's largest obelisk, thereby bringing everlasting glory to their Creator's name. And now for the whole inside story, step by step. In length, the obelisk is almost 42 meters, weighing about 1,200 tons. Officially, it is around 3,500 years old and is made of red Aswan granite. It is with this granite that we will begin our investigation. Which isn't granite at all, but goodness knows what. Muhammad El Gohari, a professor at Sohag University in Cairo, studied the unfinished obelisk and the quarry it supposedly came from in detail, publishing a paper in 2011 entitled Analytical Investigations of the Disintegrated Granite Surface of the Unfinished Obelisk of Aswan. Let us quote a few excerpts from this article, written by a respected professor holding a diploma from Cairo Institute of Geology. Tasudite, kaolinite, illite, and gypsum defined and calculated both in affected and non-affected areas to be reformulated hardly understandable. Indeed, it is difficult to understand where such a combination of clay minerals and gypsum came from, especially when it's not just found in affected areas, but also in non-affected areas. But the professor was able to wriggle out of this conundrum, explaining the presence of clay materials and gypsum in the granite as the chemical influence of a polluted environment on feldspar, a component of granite which, via a so-called kaolinization process, somehow yields a multitude of clay minerals, or to put it simply, clay. Of course, how such foreign clay compounds plus gypsum really ended up in this so-called granite to begin with the professor, of course, could not say, because to do so would have instantly put an end to the main tourist attraction of the small Egyptian city of Aswan, as well as to his own scientific career. By the way, the Aswan Low Dam, built by the English over 120 years ago out of local Aswan granite Sinite, was likewise under the influence of the very same atmosphere as the Aswan Obelisk, as well as the not very clean water of the Nile. However, nothing happened to the granite of the dam over the course of 120 years, because the issue here is not the environment, but rather the obelisk itself, which ceased being granite, in the sense of being made of real, natural granite, at the beginning of the 20th century. Let's turn to 19th century sources. The well-known German guidebook publisher, Karl Baedeker Jr., a worthy successor to his father's work, released a handbook for travelers to Upper Egypt and Nubia in 1892, in which he indicated the dimensions of the unfinished Aswan obelisk, 92 feet in length and 10 and a half feet in width at the foundation. It should be noted that 72 feet of its length, an important note, were cut out of the Rocky Mountain. Allow us to remind you that the length of today's Aswan obelisk is equal to 42 meters, whereas 92 feet is 28 meters, and 10 and a half feet at the foundation, that's also not 4 meters and 20 centimeters, rather it's 3 meters and 20 centimeters, 
which is a whole meter shorter. Here is one more mention of the Aswan Obelisk. There is no date on the title page, but Google Books dates this source as 1877. It is 133 miles from Luxor to Aswan, the border region of Egypt, where the Roman satirical poet, Juvenal, languished in exile, home to the first rapids of the Nile and the grand quarries that supplied all of Egypt with pink granite. It also plays host to the obelisk, not separated from the Rocky Mountain, but bearing evidence of craftsmen's hands on it, as though they had suddenly been torn away from their work. The dimensions of the obelisk in Syene, this is another name for Aswan, and the source of the name of Aswan granite, Syenite, were noted down differently. For instance, 100 feet by 11 feet, or 95 feet by 11 feet. Some suppose that the obelisk was abandoned due to the crack that appeared in it. Others believe that the crack came later. The superior quality of Aswan granite allowed chunks of 60, 70, or at times over 100 feet to be separated from the rocky mass. The unfinished obelisk demonstrates the trick that allowed huge stone blocks to be separated from the rocky mountain. Along the line marking the boundary between the obelisk and the rocky mass, a very important note the line of the boundary between the rocky mask and obelisk lies a sharp groove. And along this whole groove, short distances apart, are openings intended to receive wedges made out of dry wood. When the wedges were tightly hammered into the openings, the groove was filled with water, and the dry wedges gradually absorbed the water and swelled. And the force created by this swelling was sufficient to crack the granite along the entire length of the groove. So now, Let's look at these grooves into which the quarry miners hammered the wooden wedges. It's patently obvious that the 19th century sources described a completely different obelisk, which ceased to exist at the beginning of the 20th century. There aren't many photos of the obelisk from the 19th century, but there is a high-resolution photo from 1851, which we will talk about a little later. In 1922, Reginald Engelbach informed the world that the obelisk had been unearthed, and in the same year, he released a book in which he described his outstanding discovery in detail. The first part of the book, The Description of the Obelisk, immediately begins with a disclaimer that the obelisk had long been known, but its dimensions, 95 by 11 feet, had been incorrectly indicated by some authors because nobody had ever bothered to clear the obelisk of sand along its entire length. That no one had ever cleaned the obelisk before he had is simply surmise on the part of Engelbach. Nineteenth century sources insist that the length of the obelisk is 92 to 95 feet and 10 to 11 feet wide at its base. To clear such a remarkable tourist attraction of sand and rock was not beyond the capabilities of nineteenth century technology. And certainly, the lucrative possibilities of being able to behold the largest obelisk in the world in all its glory conveniently located near a tourist hotel. Operated by the supremely wealthy Thomas Cook Travel Agency would have surely outweighed the expense of clearing it of sand and rocks. Thomas Cook was the first international travel agency in the world. Its fleet on the Nile consisted of 16 steam vessels by the beginning of the 20th century, as well as countless smaller boats. The length of the obelisk unearthed in 1922 turned out to be much larger than 92 feet, almost 137 feet, or 42 meters. And the obelisk also turned out to be a whole meter wider at its foundation than the measurement taken in the 19th century. One could say that the engineer Egyptologist gave himself away when he wrote in his book that the obelisk had been covered with large rocks, which it had been necessary to break into two or even four parts in order to lift them off the obelisk. But how do they end up on top of the obelisk? While it's clear that the sand was blown there by the wind, how do we explain the hundreds of rocks, many of them impossible to lift, on top of the obelisk? Maybe these stones were needed by Engelbach himself to back up his words that the obelisk had never been unearthed before. That is certainly how it seems. The engineer Egyptologist's second blunder was much more noticeable. He left behind evidence no, not of an ancient, antediluvian, highly developed civilization, but imprints of sacks that, together with large pieces of tarpaulin, 
had served in the role of formwork. Because of the traces of these sacks, it was necessary to come up with a theory that the ancient Egyptians had created these rectangular indentations by rubbing the obelisk with stones. But the scientific world, odd as it may seem, swallowed this outlandish explanation entirely. Despite the fact that these rectangular indentations were found not only on the obelisk and next to it, but also on the quarry granite far away from it. This has no logical explanation within the framework of Engelbach's own theory of their origins. And there's one more oddity about this obelisk. What is stonework doing here? Why is it needed in a granite quarry? There is also stonework on the other side, apparently to ensure that the obelisk wouldn't become covered in sand again. But where did literally mountains of sand come from on top of a granite hill? At the base of the hill. That makes sense. But what is sand doing at the top of a tourist attraction? What is its purpose? Why wasn't it cleared in the same way as the obelisk? This photo is from 1955. The sand is still covering the quarry and hanging over the obelisk. And not only is no one rushing to move it away, on the contrary, more is being added in order to hide something from the curious eyes of the tourists. And this photo is from 1999, totally fresh, you could say. The stonework supporting the mountain of sand is still in place. The next photo is in chronological order. The sand has already been removed, but a large slip cover has been made, which has been used to cover something up. Evidently, the same thing that was previously covered by the sand. Most likely, evidence of a jackhammer had been concealed from tourists for a long time because it was unclear how to explain its origins. A multitude of different Aswan guidebooks were printed in the 19th century, but not one of them mentioned the rather remarkable rectangular indentations with rounded corners and the evidence of a jackhammer. And there is also no mention that the whole quarry was covered in sand. Here is one more such source from 1858. There is nothing said about the rectangular indentations and the piles of sand in the quarry. A normal quarry is described, in which granite blocks were split off from the parent rock in the traditional way, by means of a shallow groove and wooden wedges moistened with water. This was exactly the problem with this old and prior Aswan obelisk, because the Egyptians, the granite quarry miners, made grooves and openings in the granite with the aid of iron tools. Iron ones! which they, according to the new extended version of history, accepted in the scientific world relatively recently, shouldn't have had. On the basis of the facts related above, the history of the so-called unfinished Aswan obelisk appears to be the following. It is a real granite quarry and a real obelisk. But after European academic historians at the end of the 19th century decided that the ancient Egyptians were actually very ancient indeed, and therefore hadn't been familiar with iron. The evidence of iron tools in the quarry and on the obelisk had to be cleaned away. A thick layer of granite concrete was poured, like chocolate glazing over a wafer, over the old granite quarry in different places, together with the old obelisk, which is why its size increased both in length and width. Most likely, the obelisk is a stacking doll, the real unfinished Aswan obelisk out of natural granite rests inside, while on the outside is a modern obelisk made of artificial granite. The concrete works were completed by British engineer Reginald Engelbach at the beginning of the 20th century. Jackhammers were evidently used to improve the updated landscape of the old quarry, but they clearly overdid it with the jackhammers. The result turned out to be rather rough and sketchy, which is why it was necessary to cover up most of the quarry with sand. As already stated above, this Wikipedia photo is dated 1851, but in it we can clearly see evidence of the work of a jackhammer, which was only invented at the end of the 19th century. And this is far from the first example of historians resorting to outright and undisguised forgery. And this is the very spot on the mid-19th century photograph showing evidence of the work of a jackhammer which only became widely used at the beginning of the 20th century. Because of the traces left behind by the sacks, it was necessary to invent the very silly theory that the ancient Egyptians rubbed the obelisk with stones. Here is what Reginald Engelbach himself 
the father of this wondrous obelisk, writes about it. A feature of the surrounding trench is that there are no corners. Everything is rounded. Neither are there any traces of the marks of wedges, which are quite unmistakable. And further on, there are no traces of chisel work in the trench at all, and not a trace of any copper implement was found during the clearance of the obelisk. We are therefore forced to the conclusion that the large balls of tough greenish-black stone found in such profusion round the obelisk and all quarry work at Aswan must have been the tools employed. End of quotation. In 1920, Engelbach was appointed Chief Inspector of the Ancient Egypt Antiquity Service, and on the territory entrusted to him, he found an anomaly, Aswan's unfinished obelisk, a pilgrimage destination for tourists ferried there by the Thomas Cook Company, with evidence of the use of iron tools that ancient Egyptians shouldn't have had in the first place. And you already know what happened next. In the next film, we will talk about Egyptomania, in other words, society's heightened interest in ancient Egyptian artifacts, the demand for which exceeded supply, which numerous archaeologists conmen used to their advantage.